Hello, everybody. Okay. Hello. Say hello, Mum. Hello. There we go. I see you, everybody. There we go. I just realised, like, last week, I've never called you by your name. I just call you Mum. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it like that. I didn't, I just said, like, live with my mum. What is my name? Mum. Your name's mum. Like when you're in a store in a supermarket and everybody goes, mum, and all the women turn around. Do you still do, you still do that? <laughs> I mean, like, in a store, you're just like, no, I'm not. No, go away. Leave me alone. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. Right. So the history of quilting. I don't know if this is going to be as fun as last week. And Neil last week was there like, where are you getting your information from? And I'm there like, from Wikipedia. And he goes, well, how do you know it's true? How do you know it's factual? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Just, I'm doing this for entertainment. <laughs> So if any if any historian wants to come on the show, like it's like totally like a cheap show, like we just <laughs> we just come on and start talking. And if you want to like fact check me like afterwards, then be my guest. <laughs> it's an engineer, isn't it? I know, I know. So what what do you know about Courton anyway? Did you know anybody who quilted ever? Um, well, not really, not in that family, no. But you said you've always wanted to do a quilt, so where have you got that from? I don't know, it was, I, I did, it was something I always wanted to do and you ended up doing it instead. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, like, what, from when? When have you always wanted to do a quilt? Oh gosh, it was like, uh, it was that years ago. It must have been about 20, 25 years ago. Really? I did. Yeah, I started collecting like um, I did start collecting fabric and that. I don't remember. It might have been even longer than that because I, I don't know if he was actually born when I was thinking about doing it. Well, thank you, Mum, for it. saying that, that I'm 25. I love you even more now. <laughs> It might be longer than 25 years ago, because I think it was like... Because I used to do a lot of uh, dressmaking and that. I used to dress make for myself and I used to make Shane clothes, you know, things. Well, the one thing that I used to love, like, the one thing that you did that I always remember that you sewed, um, was that jacket that you went and did that class with. And you were like, oh, excuse me. Um, and it was like a it was like a plum colour, and then you put some lace over the top of it or something. It was real, It was gorgeous. Yeah, it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be, it was a suit, that. Did you ever finish it? Like, what did you do? I didn't really, no, I don't know, I, I really don't understand why I didn't finish it, really. Because it, it was really, it was gorgeous. <clears throat> it was, it was, it, it turned out really nice, but I didn't finish it off for some reason. So that one of those things, it's like you do that, don't you? I don't know, it's. It was so what did you do? You just throw it in. You must have thrown it in the garbage. You had to have done because you don't have it. Yeah, I must have done really in the end. And what do you tell me not to do? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I always say to you, don't throw anything away. I know your bits. I know. Practice what you preach. Yeah, no, but Dr. Gate was a long, long time ago, and he's like, you, you know, you have a business and that. It wasn't that long ago. I remember you doing it. I was at least, like, I was still at school, like, teenager, I think. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I can't yeah. remember. I can't remember. I've been bit by a few mosquitoes in the garden today. Oh, they're, no. they're out. And it's itchy. Okie dokie. So... The history of quilting, the stitching together of layers of padding and fabric. Padding? It's the first time I've ever heard of padding. Um, may date back to as far as 3400 BCE. What is BCE? 
Rather, I don't know. Really? What is it? I have no idea. Don't, don't forget, terminology always changes, you know. What do you mean? Doesn't it? Well, you said what's padding. That's probably what they called. Um, I know, but this Wikipedia right? wasn't written like millions of years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but it depends how long it was written as well, doesn't it? Because the terminology just always changed. And maybe they always saw, you know, even though people are writing these, um, you know, these, uh, what do you call them? You, know, you say scriptures. scriptures. When people are writing these scriptures. scriptures. <laughs> you are. <what>? Scriptures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just being I silly. So I know that BC stands for before Christ, but I don't know what the E stands for. No, I don't. Anyway, so for much of its history, quilting was primarily a practical technique to provide physical protection and insulation. Physical protection? Yeah, there was, a, don't forget the quilts in, when they used to make quilts before. They would use it to sort of like to keep themselves warm in bed. No, no, I don't think it's going. I'm not thinking about war here, physical. So let's let's read on. Um, however, decorative elements were often also present, and many quilts are now primarily art pieces. <clears throat> so in Europe, quilting appears to have been introduced by the Crusaders in the 15th century. In the form of the, see, this is it. That this is what's going to happen now. I'm not going to be able to pronounce anything, and it's annoying. Um, it's annoying for me as well as the people trying to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the form of Aiton and Gabison, a quilted garment worn under armour, see, which later developed into the doublet. The doublet? The doublet. So sometimes Wikipedia lets me hover over, over a word and it tells me what the word is. So a doublet is a man's snug fitting jacket that is shaped and fitted to the man's body, which was worn in Spain and was spread to Western Europe from the late Middle Ages up to the mid 17th century. The doublet was hip length or waist length and one over the shirt or drawers. Do you like that? Or drawers. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go and put my drawers on. <laughs> oh, sort of what? They were just big padded panties. <laughs> anyway, which remained an essential part of fashionable fashionable men's clothing for 300 years until the early 1600s. One of the earliest existing decorative works is the Tristan quilt made around 1316 in Sicily in one of the earliest surviving quilts. It, oh, sorry. It is the one of the earliest surviving quilts in the world and at least two sections survive located at the v and a museum in london mom so like if any of my viewers so if any of the viewers are from the uk and you quill you have to say it in the comments down below because my mom doesn't have as many quilters in the uk so you're gonna have to let my mom know that <laughs> um and where are you all where are you all what are you talking about all the quilters in the uk where are all the quilters in the uk um, That's what I mean, I to know. I know. Um, let's see if I can... Can I actually stream my YouTube while I'm talking to you as well? I've got a lot of devices on YouTube right now, aren't I? <clears throat> oh, no, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. Don't do that. I've got your audio coming out of this one. Okay, so um, it is the earliest of my... Da -da -da -da, at the Museum in London where nobody quilts. And... <laughs> somewhere in London where nobody quills but anyway and in Bargello Palace oh 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 so there's a quilt pattern called the Bargello quilt I wonder if that came from the Bar Bargello Palace do you reckon there's a connection there it's possible it's the same name isn't it because the Bargello Palace 
It used to be a former barracks and prison, and now it's an art museum in Florence, Italy. Ooh, so you learn a lot from this show. Well, you learn a lot from Wikipedia and my regurgitation of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, another of the Tristan and Isolide story is held in the private collection. So in Russia, the oldest surviving example of a quilted piece is a linen carpet found in a Mongolian cave. So do you know what? Like, aren't we all supposed to be related to the Mongolians or something? I'm sure there was something about that. We're all, we're all actually related. We go back to Genghis Khan, apparently. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, a data between 100 BCE. BC what does BCE mean? And, oh, here we go. Now we've got 200 CE. It is now kept in the St. Petersburg Department of the Russian Academy of Sciences, archaeology section. Um, the United Kingdom and Tasmania. Can anybody oh. let me know if the, is the audio okay online for the two people that are watching right now? Just let me know. Can you hear me? Um, so in the United Kingdom and Tasmania, the National Gallery of Australia has a 3 by 3 metre, 9.8 by 9.8 feet. So it's a little bit taller than Neil, because Neil's six foot seven. Known oh. as known as a Raj, a Raj quilt. It was created about three hundred it was created by about three hundred convict women as they were transported from Woolwich, England to Hobart, Tasmania in eighteen forty one. The quilt was rediscovered in Scotland in nineteen eighty nine and it is a medallion quilt with broadery oh, I just can't pronounce these things. Broadery purse or something is in the centre. I mean, considering it was done like so many years ago, it's pretty impressive. Audio is fine. Thank you, Roberta. Okay, so the United States, quilt making was common in the 17th century and the early years of the 18th century. Canolial, canolial, I can't say it. <laughs> canolial quilts, yeah, were not made of leftover scraps or worn clothing as a humbug were not made of leftover scraps of worn clothing as a humble bed covering during this period. Instead, they were de decorative items that displayed the fine needlework of the maker, such as Baltimore album quilts. Huh. Okay, so all they're doing now back then is they're basically just embroidering little pieces and they're joining them together. So basically like what we're doing in embroidery machine today, like they were just like, they were doing it by hand. And they were just like mm -hmm. doing, embroidering all these little pieces and then just put them all together in a quilt. Actually, it's pretty cool. Have a look at a Baltimore album quilt. <clears throat> well, that's a heck of a lot of work, isn't it, eh? It is. Um, and they have become one of the most popular styles of quilts and are still made today, you see. These quilts are made up of a number of squares called blocks, and each block has been appliqued with a different... Oh, it's like applique. Oh, right. I'll be good for you, that, then. Oh. Baltimore quilts. So only the wealthy had the, le only the, wealthy had the leisure time for quilt making. So such quilting was done only by a few commercial blankets or woven coverlets. Woven coverlet. It's a type of bed. What? They have some strange names, don't they? <laughs> so, like, why do I not know words? This is so, like, how do you get to my age and you still don't know what a woven coverlet is? Should I know that? <laughs> oh, I don't. Does anybody else know knew that? Yeah, does anybody <laughs> know what a woven coverlet is? Because I didn't know what a woven coverlet is. Anyway, it's a type of bed covering with a woven design in coloured wool yarn on a background of natural linen or cotton. Coverlets were woven in almost every community in the United States from the colonial era until the late 19th century. Huh. <clears throat> 
So it was like it was like, it was like crocheting. I wonder how how long does crocheting go back? Were people crocheting when you were younger? Yeah, yeah. My mum used to do it. She tried teaching me that. She's gonna get. The, so that's the one with the yeah. one needle, yeah. And you have to like do it. But like my tension is always like so tight that I can't. Like when I do knitting, it's the tension's too tight. I can't loosen it up. <clears throat> oh. Lord. And for some weird reason, when I'm knitting, I can't hold both the needles at the same time. And I, I don't know, I just can't do it. <laughs> well, that's how you're supposed to knit. <laughs> I, don't, it's like, it's, I don't know, I just can't hold both the needles in, in the fashion that you're supposed to knit. And you see these women, like, going hell for leather, like knitting. I don't know, it blows my mind. It <clears throat> blows my mind. That's fine. Michelle Claus. Even the patterns though, they like, it's just like sewing patterns, like it's, they're just bizarre, like how to read them. And, and once she, you find, once you know, you, you know, you're okay, what, what they mean. So any way, um, quilting is now a popular hobby with an estimated base of 21 million quilters. Hi there, 21 million quilters. Please subscribe to the Feridel Creation um, YouTube channel. <laughs> is it in the UK? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the US. This is just the United States. 21 million oh, quilters God. in the US. So. They always gone about the US. They never see about anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. I just read about UK, Russia and Europe. Oh, yeah, yeah, you did, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, whole cloth quilts. Early whole cloth bed quilts, which may appear to be a solid piece of fabric, are actually composed of strips of fabric. Since early looms could not produce width of cloth large enough to cover an entire bed surface, well, I'm just going to say, well, they can't now, but they can actually, because you can get fabric at 108 width now. But it's super expensive. Is it? I don't know mm -hmm. actually. For the cost, like, so for a general cost of a meter here in Canada, you'd look at it about like, I don't know, it's so about 18 bucks your average price of a meter. And I think for the 108th width, so a general width of a quilt and cotton would be 40 inches. And then for that 108 width, I think it's about, I want to say like 35 bucks maybe. So I guess it's not, it's, it's kind of reasonable, isn't it? When I look at it that way. I'm going to just be, I mean, I'm yeah, gonna... I suppose the manufacturers when they're doing the, you know, like the duvet covers and that, they, they must get it from somewhere, mustn't they? Because you've got king size quilts and stuff like that, haven't you? Well, I'm sure they can like find, like, they, they just get the, they just get them to cut it however long they want when they produce it. Mm -hmm. Um... Where was I? I keep losing my space. Oh, Earl's here. I've been wondering why I've not had a cat here on my live videos yet and no Earl's turned up. Aww. And do you know my next word is going to be early? It says early quilts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, baby, I just said your name. Early quilts that feature the same fabric for the entire quilt top, whether the top is made of dyed wool or pieces of the same printed cotton fabric, are referred to as whole cloth quilts. Early whole cloth quilts have three layers, a quilt top, a fill-in, in early quilts the filler was often wool, and a back-in. So that was basically your quilt sandwich. And the three layers are held together by uh, quilting stitches worked by hand. In an age before sewing machines were marketed in whole cloth quilts, the quilt stitches themselves serve as the only decoration. The earliest whole quilt cloths found in America were brought from Europe. See, so the earliest quilt cloths found in America were brought from Europe. Because obviously Europe is older than... America. Okay. Initially, quilts were owned by the wealthy in America who had the means to purchase imported quilts. The collection of the lovely late. Oh, don't you just like that? I want to go there. Let's go. So it's, it's the lovely. 
It's called the Lovely Lay Museum in Baltimore. How cute does that sound? I know. It does, doesn't it? Maryland contains a, a quilt believed to have been carried ashore by a Cogswell family who embarked from Bristol, England en route to Bristol, Maine. Oh my god, that is so funny! <laughs> They're going from Bristol, England to Bristol, Maine. <laughs> In 1635, once the passengers were safely ashore, the galleon Angel Gabriel moored in Pemaquick Bay was completely destroyed when the great colonial hurricane of 1635 rushed up on the coast of, oh these words are getting so much harder, I'm just going to say Rhode Island, um, leaving the ship as just a mass of floating debris after it was hit with the strongest winds ever recorded. The Kangston, the Kangston Historical Society in Canton, Massachusetts, believes that the whole, whole cloth quilt in their collection may have been the oldest whole cloth made in America. The, the, the wool whole cloth quilt was made in 1786 by, I was going to say Martha Stewart. <laughs> She's not that no, old. <laughs> no, Martha Crafts Howard, she's called. Hey, Earl. Who's she? Um, Who's she? It doesn't let me hover over her. Oh, uh, hover <clears throat> over her? <laughs> Generally, like, if it has another link in Wikipedia, it allows you to hover over it, and then, like, you can read a bit more about it. Oh, right. The Buckingham quilt surfaced in 2014 and it was made by a wife of Reverend Thomas Buckingham, one of the founders of Yale University and passed down through nine generations. It is almost the oldest wholesome, whole, I keep saying wholesome, it's whole cloth. Let's call it, <laughs> it's a wholesome whole cloth. <laughs> it's amongst the oldest whole cloth quilt made in America. Um, a more complete survey is needed to compare all of the whole cloth quilts held in the many museums located locations who have collected such textiles. Many early quilts did not survive the test of time and were discarded because they generally say that cotton can only last like a hundred years like if it's not like protected. Yeah yeah um, sunlight, well there's many different variables as well because like you've got the, the the quilt cotton like the fabric and you've also got the um the thread <clears throat> yeah uh it's almost the oldest whole cloth like where am i again see i just i turned away and i'm lost um i wonder how they used to make the thread in those days well, they would have spun it. They would have spun it on one of them, them oh, wheels. Yeah, on those. That yeah, I know. Those wheel wheel things. Um, yeah, they would have spun it on one of them. Yeah, I the name of the quilt was lost to history. See, this is why it's important to label every single quilt you do because your quilt is going to outlive you, and. Very important yeah. to label them. It I always didn't say. Go on, sorry. It's nice, it's nice to do those labels, you know, from where they come from. You know, that, that years and years, because they will last for like a long, long time, even the ones that are made now. Do you know what I mean? Well, on my like two and a half, do you have that rainbow one that I did? And it was like two and a half inch blocks. And I did a quilt label for the back of that. And it was like made on such and such a year. I put my name down and then I put, this was another one of my crazy ideas. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, so I've got this. Should, no, it's true that people should do that because all, they are worth a lot. They are. And the paintings and things, don't they? And people put to names on furniture and stuff. You know, people should sign, put something on the quilt. 
And I always like to put a label on my quilt, especially like from your first ones, like going like, for, like some people actually number them. So like one, two, three, four, five, six, and then number all the quilts. And then they can see then like how they've progressed as a quilter, like going through. Like I think it's a really good reference guide for like all of us to like do stuff like that. Well, yeah, it is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And stunning, they're all stunning. They're all pieces of art in their own ways, you know what I mean? They are. They're beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Stunning. So for a time, the trend in whole cloth quilting was a preference for all cloth white quilts. See, this is another one I keep saying I want to do a white quilt. Now it's, it's, it reminds me again. I keep asking you to do a white quilt. I think it all absolutely beautiful. I like, I've got white bedding and I love it. I just put white. I just love it. There's something about wine, so I don't know what it is. So I want to do an all white quill and I'm wondering like, I obviously I don't think what they do is like just get a whole, because I was wondering, do they get a whole piece of white and then they just do it back to back and then free motion quilt it? Or do people actually go to the effort to cut all of them white blocks, piece all the blocks together and then quilt them? Like, how do you think they do it? Well, I think it'll look nice like how you do, you know, those, do you know the orange one you did? Oh! <laughs> the orange one you did just recently, I think that would look good like that. So do you that think what, like, all different shades of white? Like, as a kumquil? Um, well, no, do it all in white, but just do it all, do you know how you did the... Oh, you did, what, is, what is it called? A scrum? I thought I did one. <laughs> you call it a scrum quilt? <laughs> a scrunchy quilt. It's a scrunchy It's called a crumb quilt. And I think it's called a crumb quilt because, like, you're getting all of your bits and pieces, like your crumbs, and you're making a quilt out of it. So I think that's oh, where the really? reference come from. But I like your scrum quilt. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's funny. <clears throat> um, I love it. I really, really like that. <laughs> this is why I like you on because you say the most funny things. <laughs> so many of the beautiful surviving whole cloth quilts feature feather designs, outlines of flowers, and are based on other designs taken from na from nature motifs. Some were made even more ex exquisite by the use of stuffed and corded quilting, a method sometimes called trapunto. <clears throat> Do you know what tra tra you know what trapunto is? No, what is it? You almost basically did a trapunto quilt when you did that puffy quilt. What was the puffy quilt you did just recently called? Oh, the um. The bubble quilt. Bubble quilt, yeah. So basically what a trapunto quilt is, is um they will like layer like three different layers of quilt batting inside of the quilt box. And then they will like free motion quilt a design, but you don't do all of it. So what happens is, is that the, um, the it, it puffs up and it creates like a raised like effect. <clears throat> oh, so like like a 3D thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. So trapunto is an Italian word used to describe the technique of slipping extra stuff in into certain areas of the quilt to create areas of raised motifs that stand to stand in relief. So basically, Joe, you know that, um, that, that, oh, I'm trying to find the word, the table runner that you like, where I did it of the cats, of that cat design, and I was struggling oh, yeah. to understand, like, what should I do on the quilting of it? So if, if I just echo around them cats, when I wash that tablecloth, that the cats will stand up, you know, because you haven't quilted them down. <coughs> oh, yeah, so it's, it'll look like a 3D effect. Then. Yep, yeah? yep, yep. Oh. So, for an example, stuff, stuff in place inside the quilted outline of a feather or flower make the design stand out. So women were sometimes proud of their finery wrought and even spaced quilting stitches in their whole cloth quilts. 
This type of quilting seems to be experienced a revival today and some quilt stores sell pre-made quilt tops ready to be layered with quilt and quilted either by hand or by machine. Now I didn't know that. No. So they must have, like sell panels at the store that you can actually do tripunto on. I have no idea. <clears throat> I've seen panels and I look at them like I don't know what to do with them. Yeah, I've seen, yeah, the panels, yeah, I've seen the panels. And a lot of people, all what people do is like they'll use the, they'll put the panel in the middle and they'll like free motion some of the outlines. So like if there's like a C in the scene, or if the C in the scene, they're like free motion quilt, they're like the water. I suppose you could make your own panel on, couldn't you really? Well, these ones are actually like just printed like for like a landscape kind of thing. I know, but I, I never, I, personally, I don't particularly like them. <laughs> say say my, how you feel. This is my opinion. This is my opinion. I don't like panels. No, but you like, I got that New York panel, remember, and you pretty much like that. Maybe I can change your mind on panels. Yeah, that, that, that New York one was okay, yeah. I still haven't done anything with that yet. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> oh, this cough, I'm so sorry. Anyway, broadery per se quilts. I, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing this right. Broadery purse, purse. Oh, that's that other one. Okay, we spoke about this one before. It refers to a technique cutting motifs from printed fabric and applicating them into a solid background. This form of quilting making has been done since the 18th century. The popular printed fabric during this period was chintz imported from India. Printed fabric was expensive even for those who were well off. Oh my word. Here we go. <clears throat> Printed fabric was expensive, even for the well-off people, Mum. By cutting out birds, flowers and other motifs on printed fabric and sewing them onto a large hand-spun cloth, a beautiful bedspread could be made. The, the technique was also used on some early medallion quilts as an example. Broderie, purse, bed coverings were usually used on the best bed, on the best bed? What's the best bed? <laughs> Did you used to have a best bed? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that so, the only, so the only colour bed coverings on the best bed or sometimes only when guests were staying in their in the home. Why? Oh, it was the best, yeah. Why? That's the, because it made it look like they were, you know, like, I don't know. People, this is what people like. I'm oh, sorry, I almost spat my seat out. <laughs> I am so over that era of like, I only use these for best. I only use these for best. Like, because at the end of the day, like, if you only use things for best all the time, like, you never use them. And life is too short and you don't know, like, I'm going to get morbid here now, but don't, just use it. If you have it, use it. Yeah, it's true. I know, I know that people wish us to do that with, like, the the fine pottery and stuff like that, wasn't it? You know, they bought... Oh, and saying about the best thing. while you're on, did you drink all of my Earl Grey tea when you were over last year? Oh, did I? I don't know. Did you why? drink all of my Starbucks Earl Grey best tea? I don't know. I don't... Did I? I was looking for my Earl Grey, like, last night. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to have one of my fancy teas. And I'm like, where are my fancy teas? <laughs> oh, my God, really? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I very, very rarely drink them because they're my best tea. <laughs> <laughs> what have I just told everybody? Don't say my own thing. You've got your best tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I am not sponsored by Starbucks. Just like you know. By Starbucks. <laughs> if Starbucks would like to sponsor this show, get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Put him. Maybe from Starbucks. Well, they were from Tiavano, and I think Tiavano were like, and Starbucks are both the same company, but I think Tiavano, as a storefront, brick and mortar store, closed down. So then the tea bags were in um, <clears throat> Starbucks now. I think they're the same company. Okay, didn't know that. So I must remember to go to Starbucks and get more tea bags. Because I'm sure my mum drunk them all last year. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> my best tea. Oh my god. I'm now sat here drinking twine and Earl Grey. Oh, what a shame. <laughs> twine used, used to be really good. One of the best teas that I've had. Okay, moving on from tea and back to quilts. <laughs> Um, medallion quilts. Medallion quilts are made around a centre. The centre was sometimes a solid piece of large scale fabric like... What's that? I was going to say tulle but it's not tulle. Is it tulle? It says it's a, it made out of a linen cloth or canvas. <clears throat> Okay, um, or a tree of life quilt, Mum. Maybe I should do a tree of oh. life. An applique motif or a large piece star or other pieced pattern. The centre area was surrounded by two or more borders, although some borders were solid. Many were pieced or applique. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got some comments and I'm ignoring everybody. Oh, my. Okay, let's go back. Oh, Jill's on. We need to get Jill on the show. <laughs> oh, hello, Jill. Hi, Jill. Hello. Um, I like panels because I can make a quick quilt. Oh, she likes panels. So we have to get my mum oh, on the panel. Okay. Um, I like Tiavana Jade Citrus Mint, and I recently found out Starbucks uses the same tea. Right, Jill. I like. I don't know where in the, whether you're in the states or wherever you are from, but um, I got addicted to um, what's that tea called? Oh shoot! See, I haven't had one for so long. I've forgotten what they're called. What London Fog? That's it. Thank you, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> you have to try London Fog tea, and let me know what you think, and you'll get addicted. And I'm very sorry. But London Fog are made with um, green, with um, Earl Grey tea and cream and vanilla, and it's like so good. I recommend Starbucks again. However, I am not sponsored, but if they do want to sponsor the show, get in touch with me. <laughs> um, oh, she's tried in the green iced tea. Oh, Jill says she needs a microphone too. Huh? Oh, you're from Texas. Did you go to um I was at the um I was at the the quilt show Austin I was at Austin quilt show Were you, did you go <clears throat> Anyway so the mid 19th century changes came about as progress in technology deeply affected the number and styles of quilts made during the middle years of the 19th century the industrial revolution Here we go Brought about the most dramatic changes as textiles came to be manufactured on a broad scale. This meant women no longer had to spend time spinning and weaving to provide fabric for their family's needle for their family's needs. So there you go, that's how they did it back then. They were spinning and weaving. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that's it, the spin spinning wheel, that's it. Remember, like um sleeping beauty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the 1840s, oh, I wonder if they're going to do a live, oh, they have to, have they done a live action of Sleeping Beauty? That was Maleficent, wasn't it? From Evangelina Jolie, you know. But they told, they told the story of the Queen and not Sleeping Beauty. <clears throat> oh, that's, that's, that's actually a good seen. film. I like that film. They've done a second one of it. I need to watch it. Um, and by the 1840s, the textile industry had grown to the point that commercial fabrics were affordable to almost every family. As a result, quilt making became widespread. A great variety of cotton prints could be brought to make clothing and even specifically for making a quilt. 
Although scraps left over from dressmaking and other sewing projects were used in quilt making, it is a myth that quilts were only made from scraps and worn out clothing. Ha! Huh, there you go. That's a myth busted. Oh, right. <clears throat> Examining pictures of quilts found in museums, we quickly see that many quilts were made with fabric brought specifically for that quilt. So another major shift was in the style of quilts made. Although a few earlier quilts were made in the block style, quilts made up of blocks were uncommon until around the 1840s, with so many fabrics being manufactured, quilters could create their blocks with a delightful variety of with a delightful variety of fabrics. Some block styles quilts were made as a set of identical pieced blocks, while others contained a variety of blocks made with different patterns. The blocks were sewn together, and a border may or may not have been added. During this period, the invention and availability of the sewing machine contributed to quilt making. And in 1856, the Singer Company, oh, here we go again. Oh, no. <laughs> Isaac, no. Isaac's back! <laughs> <laughs> he started an installment plan. So, so he started the installment plans for people to be able to buy like sewing machines so that more families could afford the sewing machine. So by the 1870s, many households owned sewing machines. <clears throat> this affected quilt making in two ways. First of all, women could make clothing for the family in much less time, which left more time for quilt making. Oh. There you go. Secondly, they could use their sewing machines to make all of their, make all or part of their quilts. The sewing machine was usually used to piece quilts, but occasionally the quilt itself was done with a sewing machine. You can do it with a sewing machine. Get it in there. <laughs> <laughs> I just stuff it in. <laughs> Not exactly. Do you know what? I just can't bear to like make a quilt and then just hand it over to someone to quilt it for me. I just, I can't bear that. Like, I no, think... It's not, it's not personal then, is it? Not, not so you can say, oh, I've done this. So the one of the reasons why I didn't like long arms for such a long time is because I only ever saw the long arm designs that, you know, like, when you go to a quilt shop and it's like edge to edge and it's just it just goes edge left to right, left to right, left to right. It's all the same thing. Until, like, I got to Baby Lock and then I went to training with Baby Lock and I could see how they could actually change them designs to like make like for each individual block so you can actually like so if you've got a 12 inch block and you've got the long arm and you've got the computer software and everything you can like so if you have like a triangle on like on that part of that like 12 inch block you can set that to like just do the triangle part in one design and have it do like something else in another design so like, you can actually do a lot more on a long arm than they originally thought. So I'm glad I went to that training because it made me rethink the whole long arming thing. And that's why I go and demo them now. Because <laughs> I actually think they are good. And back, and like, just a year, like two years ago, I was like, no, I don't like long arms. But I'm totally changed my mind on them. That's if you, like, use them, like as a free motion or do, like just don't get a long arm and like just do that edge to edge thing it's so boring anyway that's my rant <clears throat> um so where was it okay so the civil the civil war era so this is where a lot of the american like quilts like, they do do a lot of amazing quilts in the american civil civil war i've seen some youtube videos on on them so leading up to the American Civil War, quilts were made to raise funds to support the, uh, oh, what is it called, the Abolitionist bon, 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 bon Movement? Oh, I can't say that word. I apologise. Then, the um, then during the war, quilts were made to raise funds for the war effort and to give warmth and comfort to soldiers. The patterns were much like those were made in the mid-century, but the purpose was different. The quilts connected to the 
abolished move movement and the civil war were made for a cause many representing the relevant flag some of them are pretty amazing <clears throat> They are though, aren't they? Is it no, it's called it abol abolition. Is that how you pronounce it? Abolition. Is that I don't know. And the role of quilts. Mm -hmm. This word's gonna pop up like ten million times now in this whole like small paragraph. I know it is, because I can't say it. So even before 1830, abolish <laughs> we're working hard to end slavery. I'm not laughing at it, I'm just laughing at the fact that I can't say this bloody word. Um I know. <laughs> Um, one way they did this was to hold grand fairs to raise both awareness and money for the... For, I'm just going to say the cause, because you know what I'm trying to say and I can't say it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go for the uh, cause. <laughs> <laughs> See, like, the history of quilting really isn't boring when Cassie reads it. <laughs> You always have a go, uh, go at me when I can't say certain things. You're worse than me for reading. Well, it's just certain things I can't pronounce. Manelian? What? <laughs> Manelian. But it's not I can't say it. It's the millennium. I can't do it. I can't say it. I don't know why. You can now say it. Millennium. Manelian. I can't. <laughs> I just can't just say it. Is there anybody else out there that can't say words? <laughs> Is there anybody out there that can't say words? <laughs> <laughs> just like any word or just like millennium? <laughs> I, mean, I, I know, I know there's a few people in that can't do say certain words. So if well, you were to say that, know. right, so it's funny because when Neil when I say something wrong, like pronounce a word wrong, Neil can't say it afterwards. He, like he has to like stop and really think about it, and then he'd be like, "Like, can you stop? You go, can you stop saying it because I can't, I can't say it if you say it wrong." <laughs> oh, <God>. oh, wordy. <clears throat> okay, so quilts were one of many craft pieces sold at these fairs and these quilts were usually fine quilts often with beautiful applique women sometimes put anti-slavery poems and sayings on the quilts um they made for they made for fairs as well as for friends and family and the goal was to show the terrible plight of the slaves and some of it they, like some of them are really amazing and obviously they're like they're really good because it's telling a portion of history it's like it's almost like um I, you know, I'm not going to talk about the virus and blah, 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 but at the end of the day, like, um, we're, we're living in a portion of history now, like, for people, like, in 50 years' time, and I just think it's kind of fun that some quilters are actually, like, applicating toilet rolls onto quilts right now. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. yeah. They're doing, like, toilet rolls yeah. and they're doing, like, all sorts, like... And I actually think it's a good thing because it's like the quilting community is like printing something for history at a later date and you never know, they might, they might have like quilts in like museums with toilet rolls on them. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I these ladies... And I'm just hoping that these ladies put a, a label on the back of them to explain why they put the toilet roll on there. But I mean, they're going to have like, I mean, we've got the internet nowadays, so they're going to know what the reference is about. But it's like, too funny. <clears throat> so, so the, th that word I can't pronounce, were active along the Underground Railroad and helped runaway slaves get to safety. That was nice of them. Um, they are stories that certain quilts were used as signals to help slaves in their flight for freedom. I've heard this. Like, I think, like, do you know, like, in the cotton fields and stuff, I think they used to put, like, the quilts out on the line or something to let people know, like, that the, um, the master had gone out and stuff like that, hey? Did you know that? Oh, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, for example, a log cabin quilt might be hung on the line of the safe house. 
Oh! So they'd hang a log cabin quill on the line of a safe house. However, historians dispute the accuracy of these stories. Oh, I don't like historians anymore. <laughs> that sounds like a nice thing to do, though. <clears throat> yes, it does, doesn't it? So for the troops, women on both sides were very active in raising money for the war effort and making quilts and other bed coverings for soldiers. In the, in the north, quilts were made were still made for fairs, but now these fairs <coughs> earned money to support needs that came about because of the war. In the south, gunboat quilts were made to pay for much needed gun gunboats. Oh, so they called them gunboat quilts in order to pay for the boats. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's cool. <clears throat> it wasn't long before it was obvious that soldiers on both sides needed blankets. Oh, I hate when they call it blankets. They're not blankets, they're quilts. We need blankets and quilts for warmth, and in the north, <clears throat> women either made quilts or remade quilts from bed coverings since the cots were narrow. Two bedspreads could be made into three quilts for soldiers. The United Sanctuary Commission was in charge of collecting and distributing them. In the south, quilt making was more difficult because although cotton was grown in the south, it was manufactured into fabric in the north and before long fabric was almost impossible to obtain so women had to spin and weave before they could sew a bed covering together regardless of their con construction most of the quilts made for soldiers on either side were either made with practical pattern and fabric due to heavy use a very few not very few survived the 21st century <clears throat> Victorian era America quilt making con continues to be popular craft during the latter part of the 19th century and the English Victorian influence was slightly delayed in the United States because of the Civil War and its aftermath. <clears throat> so the Amish, is it the Amish or the Amish? Are they called Amish or Amish? I always say Amish. <clears throat> Oh, no. it's Amish, isn't it? I thought it was Amish, but if you say it's not spelled Amish, it's spelled Amish. There's no R in it. I'm putting an R in something that there isn't. So it must be Amish. So Amish quilts are appreciated for their bold graphic designs, distinct, distinctive colour combinations and exceptional stitching. Quilting became a favoured activity of the Anabaptist sect after emigrating to the United States and Canada from Germany and Switzerland over 250 years ago. I didn't know that. I always thought no, the Amish were always like American, no? Like Germany and Switzerland? <clears throat> the earliest known Amish quilts dating from 1849 are whole cloth works in solid colours Pattern pieced bed coverings didn't appear until the 1800s. So, do you like creating, like, do you like my quilts when they're done all out of like plain fabrics, or do you like them like when they're all like different fabrics? They're different fabrics, like that orange one and the other ones you've done. No, I'm on about like patterns. Do you like the patterns on them? Like the, the you know, different patterns and stuff. Because Neil doesn't like my quilts when they've got like patterns all over them, he prefers them to be a solid colour. No, well, I, yeah, I quite like that. I like the way that you do design, and I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how you do it. I always like what you do. <laughs> oh, that's because you're my mum and you're supposed to like what I do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're amazing. I love them. Pattern pieced bed coverings didn't appear until the 1870s, particular patterns and fabrics were identified with specific Amish communities. For example, Pre-1940 quilts from Lancaster County were almost always made of wool, while those sewn in Ohio during the same period were commonly made of cotton. Often these quilts provide the only decoration in a simply, fur in a simply furnished home, and they also are commonly used for company or to show wealth. I'm surprised because I didn't think the Amish liked to show wealth. I thought that was the whole point. Like they were very, um, I'm surprised about that comment. Yeah, I, I am actually as well because there was um, <coughs> something about wool, you know, 
the, the sort of that pride in, in the... Um... I can't think of the word for it when they liked... Because I always thought that they were all kind of like equal. I don't know if this is a wiki. Oh. This is also a Wikipedia, so it could be like... It's not 100% correct, maybe. Um... Oh, God, I've lost my place again. <clears throat> now, Amish read religion discourage, is, discourages individuals' expression, but quilt making has, has allowed Amish women to express their creative natures without giving offence. How can a quilt offend someone? <clears throat> I suppose it can do in a way, doesn't it? I mean, you, you, you know, you get flags on or certain <clears throat> colours, you paint. Oh, I guess. Um, the Amish communities have always encouraged activities that promote community and family closeness so quilting became a fundamental part of social life for the women of the community. Quilts are created for everyday use to celebrate special occasions such as birthdays, weddings, raising funds for the church or community cause. Since the English, the name for non-Amish people, discovered Amish work in the late 1960s, quilting has become a source of income for many. <clears throat> Their quilts have become collector's items all over the world. Huh, that's cool. <clears throat> quilt crazy quilting fad in terms of quilts in latter years in the 19th century is best remembered for crazy quilting craze crazy quilts were made of abstract shapes sewn randomly together usually the quilt maker then used embroidery to embellish the quilt Fancy stitches were shown along the seams and often embroidered motifs were added, including flowers, birds, and sometimes a spider? A spider? A spider and wow. web for good luck. Huh. Oh, well. Magazines encourage making crazies. These simple organic quilts were seldom used for bed coverings. Instead, they were made smaller and without batting to be used as decorative throws so <clears throat> that crazy quilt that i did i was on facebook the other day and well no it was this morning the other day and somebody had posted a post of like a crazy thing that they did so they basically did exactly what i did but when they folded the thing well they must have done it afterwards i'm not quite no as they were doing it they were folding it over mom and they they did like a zigzag stitch over the creases so they like did like a satin stitch over the crease and then they also did lines on the actual individual pieces it looks amazing oh right wow <clears throat> so traditional quilt survival because crazy quilting is so popular at the time they tend to eclipse the fact that many traditional quilts were also made for bedding and commemorative utility utilitarian can you say that word utilitarian utilitarian there you go quilts were peace and tied or simply quilted for everyday bed coverings while beautiful piece or applique quilts were created for special events like a wedding or when a beloved minster was transferred to a new location these were more often elaborately quilted and in 1940s, 1950s, many farm feeds were delivered in sacks. These sacks were printed with all sorts of designs. Feed sacks were used to make thousands of quilts. I got excited about that. That's <laughs> really good that, isn't it? It's like recycling, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm missing all the comments again. Um, I don't think she went to quilt con. You need to, like, I don't think the quilt con is going to be somewhere else. Like, it moves in different locations. So, if you missed it this time, we'll have to wait until next time. Um, she's saying that's funny about quilts and toilet rolls for history. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and somebody else is saying there's a debate about the Underground Railroad quilts. I'm sure there is. This is Wikipedia. Like, it, don't take it for, like, total fact. <clears throat> Just you watch me have a historian come on and say, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
um, traditional quilt survival, because crazy quilting was so popular at the time, they tend to eclipse the fact that many traditional quilts were also made for, oh, I've just read this. Haven't I just read this? Yes. Yes, because I got very giddy about the um, feed sacks for quilting. I might actually have to um, Google this. Like, how long have I been on? I've been on for an hour. Okay, let's see, because I'm nearly done. I've just got one more left. So contemporary quilts. Contemporary quilting has evolved to include a broad range of functional, decorative and artistic styles of, that incorporate ever-expanding techniques and tools. Many quilters have experimented with creating or dyeing their own fabrics. <laughs> Susan does that. <clears throat> Susan never dyes any coloured fabric. She only ever, like, she just buys plain white dyeable cotton online and she has it delivered. She gets it, like, all on the boat and then she'll literally just, like, dye her own fabrics. <clears throat> oh, right. She never does, and she never buys any colours. And then she gets all the sh the shades that she wants kind of thing. But it's like a la Chinese laundry. Like, I don't even know how I could do that with the cats. I would love to dye my own fabric, but like <laughs> to have all of them like, and you know what they're like, the heads and everything. Could you imagine, I, I don't think, I don't think um, Sophie could dye herself, could she? Because she's black. Can you imagine the grey cats being all different colours, like blues and reds and everything? I would love to dye my cats all burn, like my hair. Oh my god. If I could have an auburn cat, I would totally have one. That would be such a, like a foxy <laughs> colour, that would be like, you can't even get cats that colour. I know I'm not going to dye my cat's hair. Just get, just get a white cat and do that with it. <laughs> I am not going to dye my cat's hair. Don't worry. I'm only joking. Incorporating experimental materials into their designs and conceptually challenging the notion of what quilting is or should be. Advances in technology such as long arm quilting and computer programs for mapping quilt top patterns and Colour schemes have significantly widened the gap between contemporary and traditional quilting. There is currently a thriving resurgence in quilting. Thousands of videos of quilting techniques and tutorials have been made and shared online by people around the world. Yes, by me also. Don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> um, continue the tradition of quilting as a social and artistic space where people have connected over countless generations. <clears throat> and there we go. And that's apparently the history of the quilt. Obviously, it's not like, you know, I don't know, like proper history of a quilt. <clears throat> but that is Wikipedia's version of history of a quilt. I want to have a look at the give feed me, sacks. Give, me, give you that, the outline of it, doesn't it? It does. <clears throat> I wonder what this brings up for um, feed sacks <clears throat> for quilting. <clears throat> oh, I haven't done much. What happens if I search Google? <clears throat> I'm doing my tapping noises again, Mum. I know. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to bring anything up. Feed sack quilt history. <clears throat> Do you know, they're actually quite cool looking. I didn't realise that they were so... Um, because I think how the history happened was um, they were running out of fabrics, weren't they? And they were using these feed sacks. And I think the feed sack company found out that these women were using them. And then they started doing patterns on the feed sacks for the women. I think you said that you got that few, few, um, like somewhere last. 
<clears throat> thing about that. So I've got, I brought up the Amokas quilt in history and I'll put that link, I better copy it before I forget it. <clears throat> hey. And put the link in, in my, um, in the feed when I come off and I don't know what it is with YouTube. Whenever I upload these lives, they like take, I don't know, 48 hours to upload. It's so bizarre. Um, so I will be uploading this live after mm -hmm. I'm done. Um, I have no idea when YouTube will upload them to my YouTube site, but it does get there eventually. Um, so feed sex bring a, a mind poverty of the Great Depression, but at the same time, there is a romance, the idea that women could make something beautiful from something so mundane. In truth, feed sex were used for sewing well before the Depression and for several years after the evolution of the feed sack is a history of in ingenuity and clever marketing. So initially farm and food products were shipped in barrels like around 1840 and 1890 um, in cotton sacks gradually replaced barrels as food containers. So I'm assuming that the barrels were too expensive so they put them into cotton sacks. And many of the logos on the flower sacks were circular, a legacy from the time when these logos had to fit on top of a barrel. Women quickly discovered that these bags could be used as fabric for quilts and other needs. Cotton had been king until the period of 1914 and 1929 when the press dropped out of the cotton market, particularly because synthetic fabrics like rayon became popular for dress and undergarments and with this drop in price the cotton even more companies began using cotton sacks as packaging wow well mm. cotton's not that cheap anymore i'm telling you that now no it's not <clears throat> so they were plain plain unbleached cotton with the um the product brand printed on them in order for the women to use these bags, they first had to remove the label. Housewives such um, use such methods as soaking the, the brand in kerosene or rubbing it with uns unsalted lard and then washing it with lye soap. Huh. Oh, wow. That's a lot of stuff, isn't it? <laughs> it's a lot of process, isn't it? And to get the label off? So in spite of all their efforts, the entire brand label didn't always re get removed and sometimes it didn't seem worth the bother. So one young girl was out walking with her with a, is it pronounced bow? When she tripped and fell. Oh, how embarrassed she was when her bereft noticed her underdrawers imprinted with Southern Best. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. This is another story was about a woman who made her husband's drawers from a flower sack and left the word self-raisin on the cloth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's brilliant. Self-raisin, self-raisin on the cloth. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. That's hysterical. It is really <clears throat> funny, that. It took a while for feed and flower sack manufacturers to realise how popular these sacks had become with, with women. Eventually, they saw a great opportunity for promoting the use of feed sacks. <clears throat> so this is when they began to um, sell them in <clears throat> different colours. Oh, it says for dressmaking, aprons, shirts and cl children's clothes. What are those? 
He said, first feed sacks began to be sold in colours and around 1925, colourful prints were making dresses, aprons, shirts and children's clothing brands appear in stores. Manufacturers began to paste on paper labels, making it far easier to remove them. <clears throat> and then it was saying in the 1930s, artists that then have been hired to um, create designs on the prints. And it said this turned out to be the great marketing ploy as women picked out flour, sugar and, and bags for the family farm based on the fabrics they desired. <clears throat> Some sacks displayed lovely border prints for pillowcases, well, for the above print and scene prints like the one below were popular. Manufacturers even made pre-printed patterns for dolls, animal, stuffed animals and applique and quilt blocks. Oh, you have to have a look at this. It's called the American Quilting History. And it's telling you all about the feed sack quilt history and the feed sacks frugal, frugal and fun. Oh, no. Oh, <clears throat> so it says, are you sure you really are you sure it's really a feed sack it's not as easy as you might think to identify feed sack fabric the paper labels were easily removed from a feed sack and even with older ones the label has often been removed a coarse weave is not a good indication as fabric like this could also be bought off the boat as well. The best indicator is a line of holes from the chain stitching that once held the sack together. Best yet, you could be so lucky as to find a feed sack with the sack stitching still in like the one pictured above. Huh. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. So we go. That is the history of Quilton. Have you had fun, mm -hmm. Mum? Yeah. Yeah. Have you learned anything? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's sign off then. Okay, bye-bye everybody. Bye-bye everybody bye. and we'll see you all next week. I don't know what the topic's going to be, but we'll find out. See you next week, guys.